Welcome to the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. Your Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts here in the beautiful Blount Cultural Park filled with artwork from hundreds of years ago and artwork of today. I'm Alice Novak, I'm the Curator of Education here, and I'm so excited to have a chance to walk through the galleries with you and look at a few historical works. We're gonna look at works from the 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. We are going to look at several themes today, including women in art and women in the art world, nature in art, stories in art. And we're going to think about, as we look at these paintings, sculptures, prints, the times they were made in, what the content in the works of art tells us about the time that they were created in, and also the choices the artist made, the formal choices he or she made, tell us about the era in which they were created, what was popular then, what was on people's minds, as we take a moment to explore art history in the galleries of the Montgomery Museum. So we're looking at a print by Rembrandt made in 1636. This charming print of him and his wife, Saskia, who's there in the background. Rembrandt is telling us a lot about himself as an artist. He boldly looks out at us, his face in deep shadows, adding to this dramatic moment where he sketches his wife, perhaps with a reed pen, he was living in Amsterdam in 1636, wouldn't have had a ballpoint like us. As Saskia is there in the background, fainter, perhaps this tells us something about gender roles at the time. He is shown working, robust, as a master of his craft, a great artist, and she is shown as a supportive and devoted spouse serving as his model, which she didn't only do in this print, but it was unusual for him and his wife to appear together. This is one of a few examples where he did draw or paint or print himself with his wife. He did many, many self-portraits. And again, we said he's living in Amsterdam in the 17th century, and we can see this increasing interest in the individual and in the self-portrait, in the artist as a master, and the expression of his artistry that tells us a little bit about the time. But there's some other things that we can think about with this print that tell us what life was like in the 17th century. Today, in the 21st century, we think about information being spread rapidly through the internet. We're living in moment-to-moment -moment news cycles. We can access almost anything we want to know about, including this print, um, via the internet. But he was also living in a time of rapid explosion in terms of exchange of ideas and even making a print like this allowed many more people to own an artwork, to see an artwork. And this was a time when the economy was changing rapidly and Amsterdam where he lived was much like New York City is today in our country in terms of the center of global commerce. And we also see his love of the past here. Those who lived at the time would have recognized that both he and Saskia, her veil was also old-fashioned, are dressed in this nod to the past. Even his gesture, his arm there um, could be seen as a nod to some of the painters self-portraits and portraits who came before him, who lived during the Renaissance, we would consider this a Baroque print. Um, that interest in light and shadow, that closeness of the artist to our space as he invites us into his artistic and creative world are very characteristic of this time, as well as this growing art market in Amsterdam and this growing way of sharing work with more people. It's an absolutely wonderful window into their life as a couple, his life as an artist, and a moment in 1636 that he captured. So we've gone from the 17th to the 18th century, from Holland to England, from Amsterdam to London, and we're looking at the work of art that 
of all we are going to see today had the most obvious function. When we look at this, we can tell it is a dish and that its function was to adorn a table, but also to serve food, to serve guests, and it is a dish with a wonderful story. We were just looking at Rembrandt and his wife Saskia and their wonderful expressions, but if we take a close look at these animals, they actually have very human-like, character-filled expressions. And they were painted by hand on this dish by an Irish artist named Jeffries Hammett O'Neill. And there's a lion and several others. And this is a serious story, but he added humor to it and a certain element of whimsy, which seems like it would work well at the table. But the story is one of Aesop's fables, and it is about forming alliances and being careful when we form alliances with those more powerful than us, that they have our best interest at heart, and the lion does not appear to have the interests of his friends in mind. He appears to be taking this deer all for himself, and he has essentially explained to them that he is the great one, he is the leader of their group, and this is all going to be his. Even though the other animals thought they had entered into a situation with him in which they were going to divide this equally, that is not in the end how he approached it. So if we think about stories on plates, certainly um, we still make a lot of plates with stories on them, usually for children. I have one of Alice in Wonderland in my office right now, but this is a, a different time and there were these wonderful porcelain dishes created and something like this was actually more affordable than what we would call China today, true porcelain from China first, also Japan and East Asia in general that Europeans had been admiring and trying to make. And at this point, they did know how to make that sort of porcelain, but this is a softer porcelain and again, a more affordable porcelain that is beautifully well preserved still today, hundreds of years later, but it, it was something that more could afford and it was a very long process to make something like this. And we talked about the artist painting this by hand, but first the body would be shaped, most likely in a mold, then fired, then there would be enamels painted on, glaze painted on, this painting on top, the gold added, and all of this through different levels of temperature in the kiln, um, repeated firings with each layer that was added. And so there's this hand craftsmanship, this devotion to the table. We again use manufactured things at our tables, and there's also, we see this love of whimsy that we talked about, but also nature at the time, this kind of free-spiritedness. And there are wonderful curves in the shape of the dish. There are wonderful curves in the little panels that um, adorn the border. And, and you see the birds, um, the fruits, the flowers, this celebration of nature and of, of style in dining. And we can imagine what it would be like to sit at an 18th century table and have this blue background pop and these colors and this story unfold before us as the story of our life went on around it in that moment, in that conversation. So you can see from this angle, the shape of this bowl, its, its foot, its curves, and imagine that the clay body was placed into a mold before this was fired in order to create this wonderful shape that was very similar to what we may have also seen in silver pieces at the time that would have appeared on tables in 18th century England as well. So that, that shape has 
these wonderful curves that echo the lightheartedness of the piece, that echo the love of nature. We can see the um, curved central panel in which Aesop's fable is painted, and we can see the curved reserve panels around the border where we find birds and fruit and flowers and really the bounty of nature that's being celebrated both at the table and in decoration and in sort of a light-hearted feminine style that was so popular at the time in Europe. And the gilding accentuates those curves and it's just a magnificent dish that we would all love to have the chance to eat from, but are happy it's preserved here in the museum today. So now we're going to be moving on to looking at some works created by American artists, though not all of them were created in the United States. So we've gone from looking at a whimsical, decorative view of nature and a scene of animals for the dinner table to a majestic landscape, a view of nature itself in its entirety at a certain scene. And this is the first painting by an American artist or work by an American artist that we will look at and the only work by an American artist working on American shores. And I look at it and I think, what, what does it tell us about its values? We think about our value of the natural world today and how it's being encroached upon and how much we must preserve it. And even when this was painted in the 1850s, cities were growing up around it and people were very aware of the need for preservation or it was a, a growing awareness. And there is so much else here. I mean, we see this small white, cabin, this sort of sense of rugged American individualism in what might be in the Catskills, what might be Maine, we're not quite sure where the painter Frederick Church painted it, living in harmony with nature and living what we might call out in the country. And it seems there's a sort of competing value of, of land being ours for the taking and uh, along with the continent being ours for the taking. Uh, but it's an incredibly beautiful example of the work of church and tells us so much about his idea and ideals of the American landscape. So we just mentioned the taking of Native American land and we are now looking at a work with a Native American subject that is also by an artist of both Native American and African American descent. So we're looking at another couple and in this case um, the moment of a marriage and this man and woman stepping together into their futures Perhaps there's a much greater sense of equality here as we see them striding on an equal plane, as we see her taking his hand. Um, this pair is shown as very much in, in harmony and in love, and it, it's quite a romantic work in every sense of the word. It is both romantic in the sense of romantic love, but also in the idea of cultural romanticism and exoticism based on the epic poem of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow about Hiawatha. And so we see a romantic work of literature being told in art. Uh, this marriage is actually uh, much more powerful beyond unifying these two individuals in that um, the tribes represented here, Ojibwa, of which the artist Edmonia Lewis was part, and Dakota were meant to be warring and not at peace. There's this great celebration 
of, of peace beyond that of these two individuals. And again, that romantic look at a work of literature, but also the way it is meant to appeal to our imaginations, but it's also quite classical. So the artist Edmania Lewis had this incredible life story. She was orphaned at 15, but her parents' influence, including her mother's um, practice of the arts and traditional crafts, continued to play out in her life. And she enrolled at Oberlin College in Ohio. Uh, you may not know that was the first college where a woman of color could enroll in the United States. And she was a student there before the end of the Civil War. And it was a remarkable story, but also a tragic story in that she still faced incredible prejudice, discrimination, and could not complete her education there. Uh, but she was able to continue her education as an artist in Boston and made um, busts and medallions of abolitionists and through this was able to finance her move to Italy, to Rome. So getting back to the work, I think we can see perhaps why she wanted to move to Rome. Um, Rome is the city of the great European marble sculpture tradition. Even the striding of the two figures is very much based on a, an ancient statue, the Apollo Belvedere, and the calm in their faces is what we would call a classical calm, the sort of uh, symmetry in the composition. And so she's able to see examples of a classical world. She's able to see marble quarried near her. And when we just look at her technical mastery and how she's able to achieve the feeling of animal skin or feathers or anything soft, tool leather, in this hard stone, we can see that when she carved, and chiseled and you use these tools, she was able to take this very strong material and make it appear delicate and to be something else in this telling of a love story, in this telling of a great epic poem, in this telling of peace through a union. And we don't really know how she felt about expressing her own identity here through um, connecting to a, a poem written by a, a Western writer. We don't, there's not a lot about her life that survives. Um, scholars have been learning more and more, but certainly no commentary about how she felt about that or why she chose the subject she did, how she may have identified with it or may not have identified with it at all if we think about the way that Native Americans were being treated at this time and removal. And she did several works in this series. Um, the father of Minnehaha, the arrow maker who Hiawatha met, um, and, and others. So there's another one near us in Tuskegee that's related to this story, and um, several around the South. So the story of Hiawatha and the story of Edmonia Lewis are both very interesting and all that is left to our imagination about their intersection. So we talked about this piece as classical in the sense of symmetry, in the sense of sort of a peaceful calm, and the use of marble, a very popular material in the classical world. But it's also classical in its interest in anatomy and proportion. And while some have described certain elements as slightly out of proportion, we can see that the artist took great care to detail the musculature, the bone structure, the way that we 
our weight shifts when we walk around our spine, which we would call contrapposto, and all of these realistic concerns about the figure being very classical concerns. And, and we might even think about the interest in science that we were talking about in the church painting with those rosy clouds and her interest in anatomy and presenting a very human likeness, both in stature and in motion. So while this was made by an artist in Rome in the 19th century, we can see this craze for classicism around us even here in Montgomery that remains from the 19th century. For example, if you walk down Dexter Avenue and look at our state capitol where so many famous moments in history occurred, it is very classical. It is also white and has columns and a dome and many of the things that Edmonia Lewis would have seen around her in Rome in addition to these marble sculptures that she was emulating uh, so we can find our own examples of 19th century classicism right here in downtown Montgomery. With this painting we see color, we see a sweet girl sewing, and we might not think of this as an act of great rebellion. But this is another painting by an American woman artist working in Europe, in this case painted around 1908 or 1909, early 20th century, and it is, it's an act of rebellion in, in several ways. This artist was expected by her father to marry and not to become a professional. Though her family had exposed her to Europe where she ended up living, she grew up in Pennsylvania and she remained very close to her family. She did defy the expectation that she be a wife instead of an artist. And interestingly, has become one of the most well-loved painters of the lives of women and children, Mary Cassatt, though she never had any children of her own. And that in and of itself was unconventional. So we have a young girl here named Francoise. She's sewing, she's threading the needle. A lot of people think she's doing something like texting when they look at her, since sewing is not something we practice as often in our homes today, but we do know that is what she's doing. We know that this was a neighbor of Mary Cassatt's in France who posed for her. And we see just the ordinary life of a girl somewhere perhaps around 10, maybe a little older. And that was not a conventional subject for art. I mean, we were just looking at a work of great literature um, from the 19th century in a time where people were interested in, in learning about other cultures and, and seeing stories um, through art as well. And in this case, this is just very ordinary. This isn't the story of a great marriage between two tribes, a famous epic poem, um, or a culture that would have been exotic to the viewer. It's, it's a young girl sewing and really choosing a moment in a girl's life and making that as important as what may have appeared historically in paintings such as great landscapes or stories from the Bible or, or literature, etc. as we've said, um, was, was a choice that was unconventional and one we would think nothing of today, but very unconventional at the time. Can we think about that ordinary moment and how that relates to Impressionism, capturing scenes in our own backyard, um, not having to travel far to find a subject worthy of art. All of these colors, the green in her skirt and the chair and the fabric as well as the red accents, they create this pattern. And again, we're learning more about interest at the time. We're learning that 
She loved Japanese prints. A lot of people in Paris love Japanese prints at this time, and Japanese prints tend to have very pronounced patterns, and we can see that influence here, perhaps. She not only collected works um, that interested her, but really encouraged a lot of American collectors to collect works such as these and by her contemporaries and peers, and, and was very influential in a lot of the museum collections of Impressionism uh, that you will see in the United States today. So there's that idea of the ordinary, there's that idea of just capturing light as it appears in a moment. And we, we started off with an artist who was thinking about light, Rembrandt, at a very different time, um, but she seems to be very interested in the light on her dress, etc. But we also have another scientific advance at the time that may be informing this painting as well, which is photography. It, it's just kind of cropped. Uh, the way a photograph might be, uh, Japanese prints were very often cropped too, but when we think about the way we see the world, the way we capture the world, uh, the camera very much uh, changed some of our ideas about composition, again, especially cropping elements so that we don't see all of that skirt. We can see her signature here, um, but we can imagine what Francoise might be thinking about in this very ordinary moment in an ordinary home in France at the time and think about all that Mary Cassatt enjoyed and experienced as an artist um, in France, the, the freedom to practice the career that she chose and to paint the lives of women and children such as Francoise.